Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. You have joined the transportation breakout for day two. So if that's where you are wanting to be, you are in the right place. And just going to kind of let people trickle in for a little bit. So as we are letting people in, I always like to tell people, um, one of the best ways I like to watch presentations like this when we're doing a virtual platform, at the very top, there's a little button that says view. I always click on it and put the speaker view instead of gallery. It kind of gives you the big picture of the person talking um, and then puts everybody else in little boxes as opposed to seeing everybody's little box um, all over your screen. So. That's just a nice way to see who's talking. Sometimes it can be hard to find them. Um, and just a good way to kind of get that full experience. We just have a few people trickling in. All right. All right, perfect. Well, um, as we get started, my name is Amy Backus. I will be the room moderator. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. I will be answering them in the chat as I can. I will bring it up to the presenter if it's something that I don't feel like I can answer. If you feel like you need to direct message me because you don't feel comfortable putting it out for everyone to see, that's totally fine. Feel free to do that. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely the person to send that direct message to. And then um, we will kind of keep all the questions till the very end and have that time for you guys to ask those. But we're gonna watch the presentation first and then have the questions at the end. So our presenters today are gonna be Marzette King, who is with us. Um, he is the mobility manager and patient operations for Phoenix VA Healthcare. And then Chris McHugh, who does the Navahix. Um, mobility management as well. So today we're going to go over Central Arizona's VA transportation program and then different VA transportation collaborations that have happened um, throughout the state and then we'll have those questions at the very end. So I want to hand it off to Marzette to start our presentation off. Marzette, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate the opportunity. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, as was mentioned by Amy, my name is Marzette King. I'm the Mobility Manager of Patients Operations in Phoenix VA Healthcare System. We're going to be talking about our program here at the Phoenix VA Medical Center and some of the information I'll share with you on our operations. Next slide, please. The VA Transportation Services here, which is considered VTP uh, for the Veterans Transportation Program, locally where the veteran transportation services consists of a mobility manager, traffic manager. We have 12 transportation assistants, 12 veteran transportation service drivers and eight volunteer drivers on staff at the present time. Next slide, please. The areas of operations as you can see would be our Sholo VA community based outreach clinic, Lake Havasu, Globe Miami, the Northwest clinic, what we call Northeast Clinic, Payson, Southwest, Southeast, Thunderbird, and Midtown. We will be adding the new 32nd Street outpatient clinic coming up in the near future. So that will be added to one of the areas of operations in which we serve. Next slide, please. Just want to give you a little briefing on our budget. We do have an $11.5 million budget that we are working under for FY22. We do an average of 485 BT claims a day. That's for veterans that are requesting their reimbursement transportation services. Also, we do about $14,000 in claims that we process for reimbursement for those claims that are submitted per day. 
we do have what we call a special mode transport, which is arranged in an average of 180 patients a day. On average, we do about 60 ambulatory patients um, that we serve by the Veteran Transportation Services per day also. And we process about 350 authorized and unauthorized ambulance claims per month. Next slide, please. We do now have an automated program for the Veteran Transportation Service, what we use called VetRide. And what this system does is actually set up the transportation for our veterans to and from their appointments. And by it creates maps for us that we can route our drivers, which saves us a lot of time on moving around the valley here. It also reduces our fuel and maintenance costs because we're able to pinpoint direct routes and where we need to travel to pick up these people in, in the most timely routes for our sake of getting those veterans to and from their appointments. And it, also it reduces our special mode transportation costs. That's where we have our contractors, what I'll discuss later in the slides, that transport our special mode uh, veterans for ambulatory sometime, but mostly for stretcher, wheelchair, and the vision impaired veterans. We also, with using VetRide, it provides us a variety of reports that we can use when we have to do our audits that we do weekly and monthly to kind of stay on track of what our processes are, if they need to be adjusted or changed, or what our costs, if it's increasing or we're showing a decrease in cost of operations. Next slide, please. When you're requesting transportation here at the Phoenix State Medical Center, we ask that you call area code 602. 277-5551, extension 7650. And we ask that if you call that number to please listen for your options or the type of service that you're needing or requesting. Next slide, please. We have a new system that has been put in place for approximately over a year now. It's called the uh, Beneficiary Travel Self-Service System, what we call here the acronym of BTSSS. And on the screen I present before you is if you wanted to file a claim, build your profile in the system, you can do it by way of electronically now. You can also use the old hard copies 103542s. And for most of you who visit our facility, you can also go to our kiosk that's stationed throughout the facility. This system does expedite your payments a lot faster than presenting a hard copy to us for your reimbursement of travel pay. Next slide, please. And again, what I'd like to share with you is our point of contacts here. Again, my name is Marza King. I'm the mobility manager. My phone number is area code 602-277-5551. My extension is 7799. Mr. Gregory Frederick, who's our traffic manager at extension 2780, I'm so sorry. Also, we're going into the Southern VA self uh, health care system, which will be, I guess, Mr. Jose Acosta, who's the supervisor of the motor vehicle operators in Tucson. Mm -hmm. And then our Northern VA healthcare system will be Christopher McHugh, who's the mobility manager in Prescott, which the transportation dispatch numbers listed be below. Also for Prescott, which will be 928-445. I'm sorry, my screen changed on me. Next slide, please. Now we do have the uh, VA transportation collaboration that was, should be presented by Mr. Christopher McHugh, who's the VA uh, mobility manager up in Northern Arizona VA healthcare system. I don't know if Mr. McHugh is on station yet, but if we can, we will just go through the slides here and um, pinpoint the information that he had presented ready. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you, Marzat. Mm -hmm. yes, this is a DAV transportation network. Uh, and I'll just briefly go through the slides if you want me to. It says on December 2021, decided to place the DAV transportation on hold pending the hire of a hospital service coordinator. I think they're still in the process of um, bringing that coordinator on board at this present time. 
and due to the personal issues and conflict failures to do assigned duties. That's one of the reasons why they're trying to do a collaboration on this. Safety stands down with all the DA vehicles brought back to the facility, safety inspected, conducted by the certified mechanics, designed new protocol procedures, brought new van phones and lock boxes for keys, established to find PDs and roads between the VA and the DAP. Next slide, please. The DAV here at Phoenix, due to the COVID, the DAV program has not restarted for the hospital director. And that's because we definitely want, you know, our, our drivers to be safe and making sure that they're well taken care of when they're out on the road. The DV is working to restart the program as soon as possible. You know, started the process to hire a new DAV hospital and service uh, transportation coordinator employees I mentioned before. They're in the process of bringing that person on board. And the goal is to have the program up and running by October through November of uh, 2022. Again, our, our patient VA travel options is that 602-277-7650. And as I had mentioned before, please uh, listen for your options before you make a selection of the service that you're calling for. Next slide, please. Do we have Tucson on board? No, Chris was going to cover Tucson too. I can cover it if you would like, but you can keep going. You're a okay. great presenter. So. Well, thanks, Amy. Yeah, I'll continue. It says for the DAV VA Tucson, currently operated with some restrictions, again, due to the COVID, reduced passenger loads for social distance, et cetera. And as we all are aware, that because of the COVID, there are some things that have changed and, and have slowed down as far as transportation being presented to our veterans. And that is because we wanna make sure that we're following the guidelines and, and the social distancing, wearing masks and not putting so many of our passengers in, in a tight vehicle. So we're, we're doing that and hopefully that will be changing. As it reads here, patients are brought to, into the main VA campus from Casa Grande, Yuma, the local Tucson and Sierra Vista and, and all the cities within the Cochise County. Prior to COVID, the average 300 patients a month 18,000 miles and 750 volunteer hours, which is considered quite a bit. During the COVID, as you can see, there's a drastic change there. Average about 70 patients a month, 4,000 miles and 165 volunteer hours. Current reduced ridership also due to the VA, uh, option of VA uh, COVID treatments, local communities, choice slash community care, et cetera, and all DA the patients must be 100% ambulatory to be able to transfer in and out of the vehicles. No lifts or wheelchair capabilities are on these vans. Next slide, please. Tucson VA patient travel option, and it'll go through some of the criteria that you must meet to qualify. And it says you must meet the qualification of 30% or more service connected compensated by the VA. I like to add into that, if you're below the 30% service connection disability, you would have to be traveling for that percentage. If it's a 10% or 20% service connection, you will have to be going to an appointment that corresponds with that disability. Or you're receiving a VA pension stipend or your low income standard set by Congress, which at the present time is $14,753 annually. You can take for appointment, can be taken for appointments on and off the campus 24 seven estates. Also, if you're trying to set up a travel appointment, you can call area code 520-629-4626. Patient travel needs, they said they need a minimum 24 hour notice. Next slide, please. Need to schedule a Tucson DAV ride. It says ride to and from main campus only. It doesn't go out to their community-based outreach clinics or to outside appointments, Monday through Friday scheduled appointments only, local Tucson from 8 o'clock to 11 a.m. Sierra Vista area goes from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. Casa Grande area goes from 8 a.m. to 12 noon. Yuma goes from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And again, you can call area code 520. 792-1450, extension 1-6565. Six, five, six, five. 
It says minimum five to seven business days advance notice and the hours of operations are Monday through Fridays from 7.30 to 12 noon. It says no answer, leave a message, return the calls within 24 to 48 hours to get back with you. Next slide, please. And this looks like we're gonna go up north. Amy, you wanna do it or you want me to continue? Um, I can do it actually. Okay. Since it is um, Northern. So again, I just wanna apologize to our uh, presenter. We have some fires going on in Northern Arizona. So some places are being evacuated. So um, we haven't confirmed that that's what it is, but that was the last word we had from him about that that might be a possibility. So, so for um, the volunteers in Flagstaff are running their own kind of transportation um, just because of the DAV was having issues and wasn't operating. So from March 2019 to February 2020, there were 3,779 veterans that were transported, which was over 216,000 miles. Um, and over 10,000 hours with 96 volunteer drivers. So March 2020 to February 21st, there were no transported veterans due to COVID, um, but then it kind of starts to pick back up August through December. So there's some DAV ongoing actions to fill positions, but the Prescott VA has hired a new hospital service transportation coordinator. So that is really good news. The VA still has to do some onboarding and there's some training that still needs to be done. So it will be a little bit of time before he is officially starting. But the estimated restart is about the first week of June. Worst case, they're saying the second week. Um, but that will be a really big deal um, to kind of get that going again. But due to COVID-19, all the DAVs nationally are having a lot of issues recruiting volunteers. And I know organizations across the board nationally are having a hard time um, getting volunteers. So, so different partnerships, the VA helps recruit volunteers. Um, they do kind of a vetting process too, and they kind of help VA driver requirements. So um, training, that sort of stuff, the VA and the DAV work really closely with each other, with each other to really make that um, a valuable service to provide. So there is a process of obtaining and maintaining the vans. We all know even with our own personal vehicles, there's a lot of maintenance that comes, especially when you're putting high miles on those vehicles. So those DAV vans definitely get a lot of miles and a lot of time on the road. So the DAV and the VA will collaborate on ways to make that um, a sufficient resource so that those vans can continue to take people and take rides. <clears throat> so there are some alternatives. The VTS is for all veterans being seen by Northern Arizona. So um, that's veteran transportation services. And there's also the travel reimbursement. There's VCC, Uber and Lyft. Um, there's a rideshare national program that's coming soon. So um, different organizations have been working with companies that already provide rides and finding ways to help um, either pay for those rides or have some sort of program where those are offering free rides or low cost rides. So taxi vouchers, another way that just getting that cost covered and working with programs um, and companies to really try and get what's already existing to just start helping out with those needs. Um, of course, friends, family, church groups, these are all volunteer areas too. Um, anybody that's kind of willing to help out a community member. Um, but like we've said before, it's been really hard across the board for everybody to really tap into those. And we're all kind of tapping into the same resource. So um, local transportation networks, there are a few buses and things like that. There's um, shuttles that will take you down from Northern Arizona down to Phoenix to the airport. Um, so there's just different things that you can use for transportation when it comes to that. So telehealth is another thing that's really been pushed since um, transportation can be so difficult in the rural areas. Being able to have your appointments without having to leave really makes it a big um, barrier buster for a lot of people, especially in those rural areas, because not only do you need to have somebody to give you a ride, 
but the time it can take to get to that resource is very consuming. You have to have a running vehicle, the money and the gas to get there. Um, and that can just all accumulate to too much for somebody. So the telehealth can be a really good alternative way to still get that benefit and those healthcare services um, without having to go through all the extra work to get those. So this is just a nice quote wanting to share the ability for us to connect to a veteran wherever they are and really whatever the circumstance allows us to provide the care at the time where it could be really needed. So this is something that we also as Be Connected really look at too. We wanna meet them where they are and make sure that we're getting them what they need no matter what. Our job is not to judge what's happening. Our job is to help them um, get through what's happening with the best services possible and without any judgment or shame. So the best thing about telehealth is that we don't have to wear pants. <laughs> we all know that one, um, just working remotely and doing all these virtual events. Um, and so that also makes it so that it's easier on the service providers as well as the people so they don't have to get dressed, especially if there's any disability that comes into play. It can be a lot harder for someone to even get prepared to leave to go to these where they might not have to do any of that um, with a virtual meeting. So these are kind of um, just some data about the different um, appointments that were made, you can see that in 2018, it wasn't really something that a lot of people were utilizing. And as COVID happened, you can see from 2019 to 2020, a huge bump, 10,000 more um, started using this telehealth service. And one of the benefits that came out of COVID is being able to kind of embrace these virtual resources and being able to really utilize them for the people that would um, ultimately be benefiting from them. And since 2020, it has only grown um, to 2021. And it looks like since, you know, we've gotten all our vaccines and people are able to go out and explore the world a little bit more, they are able to make more of those in-person appointments. But we can see how beneficial it can be when circumstances come up where going to an appointment in person isn't really realistic. So these are also, there's a picture, you can kind of see what that looks like um, and connecting with providers wherever you are. So these are kind of more information about those clinical video telehealth and all the different things that people can get, all the information that you can gather from these virtual appointments. Um, it's really incredible how much they've brought that technology up to par of what we need it to do. Um, especially during COVID and all those times where people were, were unable to make those in-person appointments. So this is where you can find more information on that VA telehealth, um, those services. It is telehealth.va.gov. So if you wanna just explore more of what, um, what kind of services they provide via telehealth and how you can connect somebody to that, this is where you would go to do that. So we're gonna jump into the Northern Arizona VA uh, Veterans Transportation Program and just get a little bit more into depth. So for an overview, Navahix covers 65,000 miles. Veterans Transportation Services has 10 drivers with nine vehicles, um, which is a lot of drivers and a great amount of vehicles, but you can imagine that can still be a lot to cover at that many miles. The eligibility for VA care is eligibility for uh, the veteran transportation services. So transport to all VA and VA authorized appointments. So you can get these when you're eligible for VA care and they will help you get to all your VA appointments. Um, the beneficiary travel, which we talked about a little bit previously, that supports the eligibility of the veterans with the transportation or the mile reimbursement. So um, either they are able to help you find transportation or they're able to give you some of that money back um, with the mile reimbursement. So COVID has had a big impact as we've talked about and the impact on that veteran transportation services, um, both the impact of creating a difficulty um, finding people and drivers able to give those um, transportation services as well as the increase of telehealth and the ability to reach more people with those. So these are some more transportation services. There's eight drivers and seven vehicles from the Prescott and surrounding areas. 
one driver and vehicle for Cottonwood and surrounding areas. Excuse me, one driver and a vehicle for Kingman, which these are all very large areas. So um, like Kingman, we definitely need to increase some of those driver availabilities and increase vehicles. And I know there's people in this group now um, that are doing amazing stuff in the Kingman and that entire area. So um, we'll be able to talk about that more. But the Veteran Transportation Services, they support the veterans for the VA and any of the VA authorized appointments. So that includes CBOX, anything um, that is authorized as an appointment through your VA benefits. And that's a Monday through Friday, and that's excluding federal holidays. So that can also just show some of the difficulty when um, scheduling, because those are all common times when everyone else is working or doing other things. So there is a recommendation to call at least a week in advance because that scheduling can fill up so quickly. So um, that can also be difficult, but a lot of times we have those appointments scheduled weeks ahead of time. So if you schedule that ride as soon as you schedule that appointment, it makes it a lot easier for the organizations to be able to prepare for that. These are all the numbers for um, all the different uh, areas that you can get these these uh, services for. This is recorded, so if you're trying to scribble them down really quickly, you um, can definitely watch this later and get those phone numbers. So we're gonna go over a little bit more about beneficiary travel. So the eligibility, um, you have the care for service connected. So disability, um, if you are not familiar, there's differences in service connected and non-service connected um, types of services. So this is just saying that you do have to have a service connected disability. Um, and there's a couple different things. I'm not gonna go over it since I am not the expert and we don't have our presenter with us. Um, but this screen will be up during um, the recording, of course, you can read over it. And then we can also ask any questions to somebody. If they have any questions on this, we'll get back to you um, when we have an expert to answer them. I don't feel comfortable answering anything that wouldn't be totally um, the correct information for you. So, so we'll kind of go over some of the mile reimbursement. Um, there is a 41.5 cent per mile reimbursement rate as of now. So there is a form that you would file with the VA and there's a beneficiary travel office. So if you are having trouble figuring out who would be um, the person to even tell you which form you should be filling out, this is the office. Um, you can go in person, mail or fax them and there is also online services as well. So for transportation, it's coordinated through that veteran transportation services. And if you're unable to provide um, the transportation for the veterans. That's who's gonna be coordinating that transportation. There is some lodging and meals reimbursement um, and there are some barriers as to like who would qualify for that. But that is something that you can look into if you have a really long distance you have to go for your appointment. Um, this is the contact information for that Navahix Beneficiary Travel Office. And it is located in that main hospital in Prescott. This is the building and everything. So they really wanna make sure that you know where to go. Um, the VA can have a lot of different branches off to it. So we're really trying to help make sure you know exactly where to go and who to talk to. So here are some of the rural transportation issues that we've identified. Um, the Native American reservations because of all the other reasons why rural transportation is an issue, the distance, um, the availability, and the access to all the things that make it possible for someone to travel far distances for different services. Um, so Flagstaff, Lake Havasu, um, Veteran Transportation Services, both of these we are all just rural areas and there's different issues that come up with that. Um, one of them being extreme weather and extreme stuff like the fires happening right now. So, um, there's a couple different issues which we will go over a little bit more and into depth about what we do about those in our next breakout. So these are some of the impacts that COVID um, has and then also vehicle repairs. So reduced number of persons that can be transported in vehicles, of course, because of all those safety issues that happened during COVID. Um, it kind of just reduced it down to a driver and two passengers. 
pre-COVID, there was 225 to 325 people transferred. And then after it was more about 100 to 200. So you can see how big of a difference that is um, on a monthly basis. It is slowly increasing as we get um, to a point that we can safely add more people. However, um, you can see how much of a difference and how much that slowed it down. Um, so there was no kind of air filter, anything. And it takes a while for everyone to get that PPE, especially when COVID happened and everyone was trying to get it at the same time. So um, due to some of those safety issues, that's why there was kind of a slowdown and in increase in sanitation and cleanliness um, while decreasing the amount of people being transported at once. So the rural impact on vehicle maintenance, it can be tough for the extreme weather. Like I said, um, you can have extreme heat to the snow, anything like that. Any sort of um, rain can make any sort of dirt road a lot more difficult to travel on. So things like that are what's going to impact that rural area and their vehicles. As well as vehicle maintenance, um, if you are broken down in the middle of a rural area, it can be harder to get your car to somewhere that can be fixed. Um, and it can be difficult to afford some of the maintenance on your vehicle, um, especially if it's a really big issue. So repair for wheelchair accessibility um, and specialized equipment, especially if you have a vehicle that you're trying to transport folks that have disabilities that need a wheelchair or any sort of um, accompanying equipment, it can be difficult to find that specialized um, company that's able to fix those and work on them. And then vehicle and driver unavailable to repair that vehicle. So like I said, um, the driver is unable to, and um, it can be really hard to even have those places available in short distances. So uh, this concludes our presentation for uh, the transportation 